go. Do you want to ask me any questions before I get started? Yeah, homework. Questions about life in general. I can do that too. exponent is x times the tangent of x, so we've got to do the product rule there. We're going to do first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So here's the x, and now I need the derivative of the tangent of x. Who's got that? Good. And the second function, and then the derivative of the first is just going to be a one. So imagine a one right there. So that. See, I didn't like it. Did you make sure you put parentheses? Did you make sure that both terms were in the exponent? Did you need? I did that, but did you need like parentheses to separate it from the? Here. Otherwise, it just multiplies by that, and then that dangles on the end. So you need parentheses up here to get both of these things in the exponent, and then you need the parentheses there to make sure both sides call it together. So it must be. What else? Not, nothing? Okay, let's take a remember all of our derivative rules for the inverse trig functions. If I remember them. Uh, here. It's going to be our marker holder. So I can go all the way over to here. Let's see. The derivative with respect to x of the arc sine of u, where u is some function of x. was square root of one minus u squared. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put the u prime up here for each of them. Then the derivative with respect to x, the arc tangent of u had a no radical on the bottom. It had a one plus u squared. And then I'll put the u prime on top. And then the derivative with respect to x of the arc secant of u did have a square root, had the variable squared in front, and it had the absolute value of that stuff here, and then the u prime on top. And I said those are the only three we need because if you want to take the derivative of the arc cosine, you just put a minus sign on this one. The derivative of the arc cotangent is just minus this one. And the derivative of the arc cosecant 
is minus that one. So derivative with respect to x of arc cosine of u is minus the derivative with respect to x of the arc sine of u and the derivative with respect to x of the arc cotangent of u is minus the derivative with respect to x of the arc tangent of u. And then finally, the derivative with respect to x of the arc cosecant is minus the derivative with respect to x of the arc secant. And this is still section 3.6, the section that won't end, but it's pretty important, so we'll take our time on it. Derivative. Let's see, let's take g of x, the square root of 3x minus the arc tangent of 7x. All right, don't worry about simplifying too much. This means the whole quantity is to the one half power. So when we take its derivative, using the power rule, bring the power down, raise that to one power less. And then we get a three for multiplying by the derivative of what's inside. So far so good? All right, then the derivative of the arctangent of u, we put one plus u squared on the bottom. So our u is seven x. And then we can put the u prime term on top. the one plus the seven X, it's gonna be squared. And then we take the derivative of that and put it right there. I said, don't worry about simplifying, but I'm gonna simplify. Put this on the bottom as a square root, this on the top, and that's gonna be on the bottom. So we'll have a three divided by two times the square root of three X. And here I'll just square that and get 49x squared. Oops, that's what it tried. Square of addition doesn't matter. Just came out of my pen that way. Good. Next 
The two other two derivative rules that I wanted you to remember was the derivative with respect to x. Um, um, let's see, I, did I use an a or a b? b to the u was itself times the natural log of the base times u prime. And then we had a derivative rule for logarithms of another base. The logarithm base b of u is most easily found by just writing it in terms of natural logs. That's the natural log of u divided by the natural log of b. Since the natural log of b is a constant, we can pull it out and take the derivative of the natural log of u, which is one over u times u prime. So let's use that here, um, find derivative with respect to x of the fraction that has two to the x squared up here and the inverse cosine of x squared down here. I hope when you're writing it down, you see that you're going to be using the quotient rule. I'll stall and I'll write the quotient rule up here. bottom times the derivative of the top. What is the top times the derivative of the bottom? All over the bottom square. Right? See the bottom, we just copy down the inverse cosine of x squared. And now to take the derivative of the top, we've got this situation. So just like with the derivative of e to the x, you get itself back. Then I'm going to have the natural log of 2, and then we'll have a 2x. So we get all of this 2 to the x squared, natural log of 2 times 2x. In order that you put it doesn't matter. Then the other way, copy down the top, two to the x squared, then the derivative of the bottom. So the inverse cosine is going to have a minus on it. 
it's got the same thing that the sign has a square root of one minus the u squared. So I'm going to have one minus x squared squared. And then on the top, we can put the derivative of what's in the parentheses here. So we're going to put a 2x. Then I've got the bottom squared. So we've got the inverse cosine of x squared squared. That doesn't look like any fun to simplify, so I won't. Uh, it's actually just reminding me of a question from homework. It was okay. like kind of an algebra problem that I was confused about. It was like three terms. It was like cosine minus sine squared minus cosine squared. Cosine of x yes. minus sine squared of x. Yes. And then, and then minus cosine squared of x. All right. So if you wanted to like do the integral of identity sine plus cosine, if you pull the you pull the negative out. That's right. Okay, so you would leave the negative in front. It wouldn't like because they both had a minus, so if you factor it out, you're good. Oh, okay. And so sine squared plus cosine squared is just one. Yes. And so that's the way you simplify it. Okay. Yeah, I was just kind of confused because I kept getting like a positive one instead. Yeah, the, the minus sign doesn't disappear. You have to factor it out. Okay. Okay. Is the reason that drove off to is because the exponent had an exponent? No, one? because the base was something other than e. Right? It looks like e to the x, except for there's a 2 there instead of an e. So you get itself back times the natural log of the power, but when you have a base other than e, you need a natural log of b, whatever the base oh. is. Okay? Cosine negative one is the same as a arc sine. Arc, arc cosine. cosine, right. Any negative is the inverse. Right. If we put the power like this, then that means reciprocal. That means this. <coughs> but if we put a negative one here, that means inverse cosine. Okay. So. Okay. So. So any other time, if there's not a negative, yeah, here, then you can put it on the outside. Right. Okay. If this were a negative two, then that means a negative two power. I'll try to write arc whatever, and that way we're not confused. <clears throat> but I got to get you used to seeing it both ways, so that when you look at problems on whiteboard or any book, recognize what you're doing. And I always think it's easiest to remember this derivative rule if you just use the log uh, conversion formula. The log base five is the same as a natural log of the article divided by the natural log of the base. That's just our conversion formula. We go from one log to the other. And both of these guys are just constants. You can factor that out. Okay. 
and then multiply by the derivative of the arc natural log of u, one over u times u prime. <clears throat> One over u. This time I'll put the u prime separately. One over u will give me one over the arc secant of x squared. And now the u prime term. Now we're going to take the derivative inside those parentheses. So we're using this. I'm not going to need the absolute value bars because my u is already positive. It's an x squared. So I'm going to put that x squared there an x squared squared here, and then the derivative of the x squared there. So there's the x squared outside the square root sign. Then we have to square it in here. And then we put its derivative there. And there's not much to simplify. You can cancel one of the x's, and you can write that as an x to the fourth. I'm not worth using my ink for. How do you feel? A little practice to get those memorized? Okay, now let me remind you of some log properties that are helpful in taking derivatives. I would know Coolio if he was a 90s guy, but I just. No. Can you sing a few bars? Now I feel like I know Coolio. But I know. Should ask you on stage, and then you might let you get the first one. Yeah, and then I know that one line. Exactly. So, like, when you sing it, you could give them. Yeah. Instead of hearing him, they could hear me. I can do that part. That's good. Yeah. Okay. I don't know who I would like to see. George Strait, bring me George Strait. <laughs> I would know him. Okay, so log properties can help us simplify expressions before we take their derivative. Um, we know that the, I'll write it in terms of natural log, since natural logs are really easy derivatives. We know that the natural log of a product can be written as the sum of two logarithms. And then I'm going to parallel that with an example. Um, the other day, uh, or even on your web work, I had you turn in a chain rule problem where you took the derivative of something that looked like this. I had a second degree polynomial here with a power multiplied with another one with a different power. Now you can just take the derivative of that using the product rule. But let me show you how easy it looks when we do that. Instead of doing the product rule, I'm going to spread this out using the properties of logarithms. And then I'm going to find y prime. It's not terribly hard to do as it is with the product rule, but just for variety, you know, more ways to do one problem. Now, in order to spread it out using a logarithm, I've got to put a logarithm in there. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. I'll have the natural log of y over here, and then the natural log of that product here. Then I can break up that log of the product as the sum of two logarithms. The log of the first term plus the 
and log of the second term. Then I've got another log property I need to whip out that if I have the natural log of anything to a power, we can put that power in front and then multiply the log of the base. So I can bring the four down in front and the five down in front. So I have four times the natural log of X squared plus three plus five times the natural log of x cubed plus two. And now they're all spread out. I'll just take the derivative of both sides. But notice on the left side, I have the natural log of y. So I've got to do one over y times y prime. On the right side, I've got just two logarithms. So each one, I'm going to take the derivative using the derivative of the log of u is one over u times u prime. So here's the four, here's the one over u, and then here's the u prime. Next one, there's the five, then the one over u, x cubed plus two, then the u prime. And then one more step. What's the last step? I want this. Show me how to get that out of here. Multiply both, both sides by what? So let me write that as 8x over x squared plus 3 plus 15x squared over x cubed plus two. Now why it looks like that, so you can put that right here, and it would simplify to look just like what you think your derivative was. So let me put that step in so you can see the product will take its shape. When I'm taking the derivative here, I use implicit differentiation and then I multiply. Now I'm going to put that in where the y is. So that I have <laughs> y prime is my y term, x squared plus three to the fourth over x cubed plus two to the fifth, and all that stuff I'm going to copy down here. Well, that looks so bad over there. So would that be the full simplified version, or that's just plugging it into the original equation? Um, I put the original y right here, because mm -hmm. what I want to show you next is, had you just used the product rule, you're going to get the first times the derivative of the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's what this is going to look like when I multiply that through, right? This times that, there's an x squared plus 3. So I'm going to cancel one of them. And I'll have an x squared plus three cubed, x cubed plus two to the fifth. And I'm gonna put the eight x right here. This times that cancels one of the x squared plus twos. So I'll have, I'm gonna put 15 x squared first, x squared plus three to the fourth, and x cubed plus two to the fourth. And that's what you got if you, took the derivative with the product rule. Here's the derivative of the first term. Bring the four down, raise that to one power less, take the derivative of what's inside. That's the derivative of the first term times the second. All right, so let me write that in red, that you just done the product rule. F prime times S. And then the derivative of the second is five times x cubed plus two to the fourth times three x squared. So that 15 x squared, x cubed plus two to the fourth. So this part here is s prime times f. Now I prefer doing this 
I prefer doing the product rule, but I just want to show you how a logarithm could spread that out. It would be particularly useful if I added a third factor here, or if I put a denominator on it, because we have a property for quotients. The log of an A over B is the log of an A minus the log of a B. We could do the same kind of thing when you've got kind of a stacked fraction, or maybe both the numerator and denominator are products. You can spread it out first, take the derivative implicitly, and then you can put the original y back in. But what I'm mainly going to use this for is to take the derivative of something that looks like a function of x raised to a function of x. So I'm going to put a little star here and tell you that we will use this, 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 for expressions like take the derivative with respect to x of a function of x raised to a g of x power. You can't use the power rule when the exponent is not a number or when the base is not a number. When they're both functions of x, we've got to do something else. And that middle property is what our something else is. So let's look at a small one first. Those my instructions were to find y prime if y looks like um, just an x raised to the 3x minus 1 power. So you got to train yourself. The base is an x, so that means the power has to be just a number. It's not. If the base were a number, then the power can be a function of x, but I've got them both. So we do this first. Take that equation and take the natural log of both sides. This is called logarithmic differentiation. Natural log of both sides. And then use the log property that brings the power down in front of the logarithm. And put the 3x minus 1 here. And then the natural log of x is left by itself there. Now we go ahead and take the derivative. It's logarithmic differentiation because over here we have to take the derivative as log, get 1 over y times y prime, and then here we're going to do the product rule. Product rule first times the derivative of the second. Second term is just the log of x, so the derivative of that is 1 over x. Plus the second natural log of x times the derivative of the first, and I'll put it right here. And then we multiply both sides by y. Let's kind of push those two together and write that as one fraction. And then like what we did before, instead of writing y here, we can write that here. Cool. 
The same thing. Here's one like your web work. Cosine of 3x all raised to the x power. Function of x at the base, simple function of x in the exponent. Right. Said the is the only one has a variable in the exponent or the four one base or both. Both variable base and exponent. You're forced to use that. Variable is the base. Variable the exponent. Variable in the base. Variable in the exponent. You have to use that. It's optional otherwise. That's what we start with. We recognize that situation. We take the log of both sides. Then use that log problem. Once you get everything down on one line, then you can go ahead and take the derivative of that as you would think. Do a product rule over here, then do implicit differentiation over here. On the left is where you get the one over y, y prime. And on the right's product rule. So you have the first times the derivative of the second. One over u times u prime. So what's the derivative of the cosine of 3x? Where'd that three come from? I mean, here, right? The derivative of the cosine gives you minus the sine, the same angle, then the derivative of the angle. Now, the other way, copy down the second term and take the derivative of the first. So the second term is all of this. But the derivative of the first is just going to be a one. So, Multiply through by the y, we get the y prime by itself. We go ahead and put this up there next to the three. If you want, you could have written the sine of three x over the cosine of three x as what? Tangent of three x. Save you a little bit here. And then finally put this back in where the y is. So 
cosine of 3x to the x times all of this stuff. If now you want to do the tangent, 3x you can. You must have typed in if this were some version of a word work. Okay. Any questions? Will you be able to recognize when to do that? I want to sneak up on you. What was the where you put a here? Yes. So you have the log of u is 1 over u times u prime. 1 over u, u prime. Log of u. One of, if that's just the basic log of u, one would oh. one over x. Right? The derivative with respect to x of the natural log of u is 1 over u times u prime. Okay, so up to this point, everything that we've done was treating y as a function of x. x is the independent variable, change in x is the dx, a change in y is the dy. So dy over dx or y prime is the change in y with respect to x. Now we're going to change the game. We're going to consider x and y both being functions of a third parameter, t x and y change over time. So imagine a point in the xy plane that is moving so that it has a, a coordinate, x, y coordinate, at a particular time. And that will be section 3.7. We'll talk about related rates. So in this section, X and Y are functions of a third parameter, T. We're interested in finding how fast x changes with respect to time and how fast y changes with respect to time, and they're going to be related by an equation. So um, the x prime of t is going to be written as dx dt. That'll be the rate of change. in x with respect to time. And our y prime now is a y prime of t. So we're going to use the dx over dt instead, the y over dt, sorry, which is the rate of change in y with respect to change to time. Here's my with respect to time. We're going to start with an equation between x and y. Then we're going to take the derivative of this equation with respect to t and get an equation that has x, y, dx, dt, and dy, dt. And that's going to be called our related rates equation. We will begin with an equation. Maybe something like this. 
x squared minus y cubed is equal to five. That we call our position equation. Just relates the position of x and y at any time t. We get the related rates equation. We take the derivative. Of both sides with respect to t. So I'll put that step in. I have my x squared minus y cubed. Take the derivative of that with respect to t. And then we'll have our 5 over here. And we'll take the derivative of that with respect to t. X and Y are functions. So when we take the derivative with respect to X, I'm sorry, with respect to T of X to a power or a function of X. So we do the outside rule, in this case, bring the power down, raise it to one power less. Then you go inside and take the derivative to give us our dx dt. Same thing true with a y. We're taking the derivative with respect to t, so y to a power has its ordinary derivative times our dy dt. We always tack on the prime term for that particular variable that appeared in the expression. So up here, when we take the derivative of x squared, we get 2x dx dt. Over here, take the derivative of y cubed, we get 3y squared dy dt. And then on the right side, the derivative of 5 is 0. Then you'll be given some sort of condition. Find dx dt at a certain point with a certain change in y. Okay, so then you'll be given, then you'll have some given point and rate, and you'll solve for the other one. You'll solve for the remaining rate. So maybe in our problem, I'll ask for something like, how fast is X changing at the point where X is two and Y is negative one, if you know Y is changing at a particular rate. So go back to our example. How fast is X changing at the point Take two negative one is on this graph. Two squared minus a negative one cubed is five. If y is decreasing at a rate of three units per whatever time period, it's going to be seconds. And so here's how you would interpret this. We see a speed question, so we know that that's a derivative, a rate of change with respect to time. So this first question says, find dx dt if you know that x is 2, y is negative 1, and here's another rate, and that's a dy dt. 
And since it's decreasing, we even make it a negative. So we take that information, shove it into our related rates equation and solve for our unknown. So I'm gonna go back up here. I'm gonna replace X with two, Y with negative one, DY DT with negative three, and that leaves us with one thing to solve for. So we're gonna take that, put it in here, and we get this, two times X, the x dt is what we're going to solve for minus three times y, y is a negative one squared. The y dt is a negative three, and the right hand side has a zero over there. So at the very end, you crunch the numbers and solve for the unknown. Two times two times dx dt minus three times the negative one squared times negative three is zero. So let's simplify to get four dx dt. Negative one squared is one. Negative three times negative three will give me a plus nine right here. And then solve for dx dt. Four dx dt is negative nine. So dx dt is negative nine over four. So at that particular instant, the X is also changing. It's decreasing by uh, negative nine fourths units per second. Okay. That's the plan. Here are some problems. So I put them on paper so you don't have to write them down. Still awake. Dragging on me this Monday. Is it bed early on Sunday night? No. I'm not out building homecoming clubs, moving toilet paper, chicken wire. Yeah. Does it? Oh, yeah, it's just like, wait, so who? I think all the dorms do that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But who comes back to all Everybody comes. It's big time. We've got all kinds of events this week. I barely have to cook dinner. I got dinners almost every night. I don't know if it's hard to build this. I have two kids. I have two. Come on. Oh, give yeah. me my days. Awesome. When you get to those things, my husband does it to me anyway. I'm just kind of wandering around. He talks to everybody. I don't talk to anybody except for the bartenders. That's the most important person there. I, they know me, man. They got my little shiner wrapped up in a napkin ready for me as soon as I walk in. Okay, so this first example is just kind of silly. We've got a bee moving around on that graph. Uh, I don't know, it's a white cube graph. So it probably looks, I don't know, what does it look like? White cubed. That looks like a cube root of x kind of graph. I'm going to draw a picture of what it might look like. It might look something like this. But if it doesn't, don't shoot me. There's a bead moving around on it, zipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And somewhere on here, say this is the point two, one. So we're told that at that point, 
the x coordinate is increasing at a rate of a half of a unit per second. So going in the x direction at one half unit per second. And we want to know how fast the y coordinate is changing. And it looks like it's kind of kind of rising. So maybe that's our dy dt that we're looking at here. I mean, you can't even read that. Let's just move it that way. That's the point two one. Let's move the dy dt to the O. Or further, whatever we're drawing. Okay, so in all of these problems, you'll be given or you'll have some implied equation that relates the position of X and Y at any time T. Then you're given some instant here at the instant when X is two and Y is one. You'll have one of the rates at that instant and you want to find the other rate. And so we start as we did last time. Take the derivative of that given equation with respect to t. So I won't even write that step down. I'll just do it. The derivative of 3y cubed will be 9y squared. And now we indicate that we're taking the derivative of y with respect to t. So I'll save the prime notation for with respect to x. I'll just use this unchanged unit. Then we take the derivative of 4x and we'll get 4, but now x is also a function of t. So the chain rule is going to give me a dx dt. And then the derivative of 28 is 0. Once you generate your related rates equation, then you put all the given numbers in. We're going to be solving for the dy dt, this one. So let's make sure we have numbers for everything else. Let's see, the ordered pair are the x and the y. We don't need the x, but the y is going to be 1. This is what we're solving for. And dx dt is given as a half. And solve for dy dt. So that's going to simplify to 9 dy dt plus 2 is equal to 0. Subtract 2, divide by 9, and we get dy dt is a negative 2 over 9. And the way, the way we interpret that is at this point, y is decreasing at a rate of negative 2 ninths units distance per second. So it must be on a different part of the graph than what I've drawn. It's part where the y's are dropping. So not a terribly realistic example. This is who has a point moving around on a curve. So let's read the next one and see if that makes more sense. Petroleum leaking from an offshore well forms a circular oil slick on the surface of the water. If the radius of the oil slick is increasing by three tenths of a kilometer per day at the instant when the radius is 0.5 kilometers, find the rate at which the area of the oil slick is changed. So we have essentially a circle. The radius is growing and the area is growing. And we want to find how they're related. So we've got to come up with an equation. Let's help draw the picture. There's our circular slick. There's our radius. And we're told that the radius is increasing. So that's the rate of change 
in R with respect to T uh, 0 0.03 kilometers per day, right? So there's our time units. At the instant when R is one half kilometer, again, that's not a time unit, so that's just a measurement for R, find the rate at which the area is changing. So you need to tell me the equation that relates area and radius at any time t. What is it for a circle? Area is equal to pi r squared. There's our position equation. Pi, we have pi. We're going to start with that. Then we're going to take the derivative of both sides to get the related rates equation. Then we'll put our numbers in. All right, let's do it. The derivative of the left hand side is what gives us our dA dt. Pi is a constant, you can factor it out. And now we're going to take the derivative of r squared. What do you think that looks like? Four? Dr dt. There's our related rates equation. So now we put the numbers in. The ADT is what we're looking for. So let's keep that symbol going on here. I'm going to write that as a two pi. I've got a number for R, that's going to be a half. I've got a number for DR, DT, that's going to be 0.3. So a half of two is one. Pi times 0.3 will be the rate of change in area. What's area going to be measured in? Kilometers squared. So this says that the area is increasing by this many kilometers squared per day. All right, we probably got time for one more. Gas is being pumped into a spherical balloon at a rate of five cubic feet per minute. What kind of thing is measured in cubic units? Volume. So the volume of the sphere is changing at five cubic feet per minute. But the pressure is constant. Find the rate at which the radius is changing when the diameter is 18 inches. We've got a spherical balloon. We know that a certain radius that the volume with respect to time is increasing by five cubic feet per minute. Find the rate at which the radius is changing. So it said rate, so I knew it was a derivative. Find that when the diameter is 18 inches. Well, I don't want diameter. Everything's talking about radius and volume. What does that mean the radius is? Nine inches. Oh, I don't want nine inches, do I? This is in cubic feet. So let's convert that to feet. Am I by 12? Okay, so three quarters of a foot. So now we've got all of our units to agree. Find the RDT when R is three quarters of a foot and the change in volume is five cubic feet per minute. We've got to find our starting point. 
which is going to be the volume of a balloon. What's the volume of a sphere? No clue. One third. Not one third. Four thirds pi r cubed. Somebody always knows this. Yeah. But if I have to use a formula, I'll tell you what it is. Did you ever take geometry? When did you have geometry in high school? This thing? And of course, your teacher didn't make you memorize formulas. You got a formula sheet because you went to snowflakes. You can't memorize things. Well, I don't even remember geometry. You remember geometry. You need a formula card for these classes you took then. Yeah. But in geometry, back in the day when you had to memorize things, did you know? Okay. You did. I always had to memorize stuff. Like ah. Okay, that's going to be the equation that relates B and R at any time t. Take the derivative of both sides to get the related rates equation. Four thirds pi is a constant, so pull it out, take the derivative of R cubed. Of course, the left hand side is B, 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 T. Four thirds pi is a constant. So you're going to tell me now what's the derivative of R cubed? Good. The derivatives aren't going to be hard. You're just going to have to pull out a formula every now and then. The threes will cancel, so you can write that as 4 pi r squared dr dt. And now let's put the numbers in. We're given this number over here is 5. With a little work, we got r to be three quarters of a foot. The drdt is what we're solving for. So let's do the squaring and get 9 sixteenths. So we're from out here, we'll knock out. 4 out of the 16. So I have 9 fourths pi is equal to 5. So I'm going to divide 5 by the 9 fourths pi. So I can flip and multiply and make that 20 over 9 pi is drdt. So tell me what that means in words. The radius of increasing at yeah, nine or twenty over nine pi feet per minute. Cubic feet per minute. Not cubic because it's a radius. Uh, just just feet. regular old linear feet. So that's going to be the plan in all of these. From the reading, determine what's related, come up with a position equation, take the derivative of it, and then fill in the given numbers. And we'll finish this up on Okay. Uh, I don't think I put a new one up yet, or maybe I did on Friday. I don't remember what I did on Friday. But I'll go look. I'll look if there's related rates problems on there. All right, with this.